I'm Stephanie Broyles here at uh, Pennington Center in Baton Rouge, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dee Merriam. Um, she is a community planner for the Healthy Community Design Initiative in the Division of Emergency and Environmental Health Sciences in the National Center for Environmental Health at the CDC in Atlanta. She's a registered landscape architect with over 20 years experience in park system planning. Her background with city and county governments and focus on green infrastructure has given her an intense interest in the development and management of the public realm and its implication for public health. So she'll be talking about the relationship between planning and health today during our lunch panel. Let's see, I should have brought my slides up. I got so busy talking. While he's doing that, let me get a sense for uh, who's here. Um, how many people do I have here that are interested in urban type issues? Is this it? Okay, as Stephanie said, I'm Dee Merriam. I'm a landscape architect. Students, if you're looking for a career, it's the most wonderful career in the world. I highly recommend it. Um, I uh, found it back in 1975, and it's just super. Uh, let's see. Why is a landscape architect working at the Centers for Disease Control? Well, back in the mid-'80s, uh, uh, chronic diseases overtook infectious diseases as the leading cause of death in this country. And the public health people started saying, what's causing this? And they found out that people were becoming less and less physically active. And so if you'll remember back in the early 90s, they started promoting all these ads about uh, get out and be physically fit, get out and exercise. And after two or three years, they kind of had this insight that you know, maybe five, maybe 10% of the population is actually going to take an hour or so out every day and go to a gym and work out. And so they started saying, what's changed? Well, our physical environment has changed so that we no longer are physically active as part of our daily lives. We are now very sedentary. We have our um, automatic do garage door opener, that we drive in our car to our parking space near the elevator in our building. We go up, we work all day at our desk, we come back down, we get back in our car, we drive back home, and we open the automatic door and we go in and we're done for the day. So um, how can we build physical activity back into our daily lives? And that's a lot about what the work I do at the CDC is all about. I'd like to start these talks a little bit about a fundamental change we've had with the world. 150, 200 years ago, uh, human populations were islands in a sea of wilderness. A couple of years ago, I was watching uh, NOVA, and they had a program about how they were having to do genetic ta tagging uh, for the uh, cheetahs in Africa in order to move them from one reserve to another 
because they didn't want to have inbreeding within the reserves. And that's how different our world is today from what it used to be. And that's something that we've never dealt with in the history of our planet. In terms of planning and the public's health, 150 years ago, uh, individuals responsible for managing their own sewage, their own garbage, and their own, own water supplies. As a result of that, as we industrialized, we had huge problems with chronic, with um, infectious disease, and we developed public services for garbage disposal, sanitary sewers, and drinking water. And today we spend literally billions at the local level in managing these services. And that all comes from a public health base, basis. Today we're facing very different epidemics. We need to recognize that we're, there's public, public infrastructure that is, plays a role in addressing those epi epidemics. And I'm going to be talking about some of the public health issues, and then I'll be moving on to some of the um, planning implications and design implications, and I'll finalize with some tools that we can use in getting that more to be a more robust part of our planning process. So diseases of, these of this century are very related to physical activity, uh, heart attacks and strokes, asthma and emphysema, diabetes. I was at a presentation a few months ago and a pediatrician was talking. He said when he started his practice in the early 90s, he maybe saw one diabetes case a year. He said by the time he left his practice four or five years ago, nearly 50% of his patients had diabetes. And these have huge implications on uh, our, our costs, our health care costs. In 1960s, health care costs were around 5% of our gross domestic product. They're projected to go up to over 20% by 2017. The prevalence of overweight among children and adolescents has been rapidly rising. You hear people talking about the problem of obesity in this country. Back in 1970, four to five percent of our children were considered overweight. Today, it's up to nearly 35 percent. Let me talk about BMI. BMI is what's used to measure how much, your, your weight to your height. I don't know why this is going forward. Um, so uh, the, the charts I'm going to show you in just a minute are based on uh, a telephone survey uh, across the country. It's done on a rotating basis, and it's uh, people who have a BMI of 30 or greater. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Okay, so back in 1985, that's when we started being concerned about obesity in this country. As you can see, five states were over 10% obese at that time, and that's when CDC started to consider it to be a problem. We had one state that was under 20% obese. We had nine that exceed 30%. That's why you're hearing a lot about obesity in the news. And uh, I, I have some handouts uh, you can get from me after that'll give you some of these websites. But there's a website that, this, that those maps are available online. You can download it as a PowerPoint and pull it into any talks that you might be interested in giving. We think that the problem is worse. Like I said, this was based on telephone survey data. If you can see the red line, that was, uh, this was a survey to determine how valid those statistics were. So the red line is what people uh, said when they were asked on the telephone, how tall they were and how heavy they are. I don't know about you, but when someone asks me how tall I am, I usually add about a half an inch. I stretch a little bit. Yeah, if I stretch, I'm that. I'm a half an inch taller. And I say, well, you know, last week when I had no shoes on, you know, I was maybe five pounds less than what I'll tell them on the telephone. So, um, so the red line is what people said on the telephone. The blue line is what they said in a personal interview just when they were talking face to face. 
and the green line was the height and weight BMI um, when you were actually measured. So we think the problem is worse than what those maps show. I've mentioned that there are many complications from obesity. Uh, there's, uh, like I said, heart disease, there's liver disease, gallbladder, um, just a whole realm of things are, are affected by obesity and um, they cost us in many ways. There's the direct medical costs, there's the increased risk of disease, there's loss of productivity. When you're carrying around an extra 30 or 40 pounds, if you had to carry that in a suitcase up and down the stairs every day, you'd get pretty darn tired of it. But when it's on your body, it's with you day in and day out, and you don't really realize it, but it's still weighing you down, literally, and causing uh, loss in your productivity and your energy levels and what you can do, and just loss in your general quality of life. So again, um, it's estimated that in 2000, we think it's going up dramatically, it was 17, $117 billion was a dollar cost of the direct cost of obesity and over 300,000 lives per year are estimated in premature deaths due to obesity. And so these children are probably disdained for these oversized caskets. Leading causes of death. Of the six great uh, biggest cause, cause of death, five of them are directly related to obesity. Back to this chart. What's so sad about this is that children that start off being obese tend to stay obese for the rest of their lives. Once, once you've gained the weight, it's very, very difficult to change your lifestyle, to change your body metrics, and it becomes much more difficult to keep the weight off. So what are the uh, environmental determinants of health? It's what we eat, it's what we do, and it's our exposures. I'm going to talk a bit about what we eat and what we do. So the f food availability is something that's being looked at more and more by public health. What's available in the home, what's available in schools, and what's available throughout the community. But also, because I come from Parks and Recreation, I'm going to talk a bit about opportunities for physical activity. What happens today? Uh, on, the, on your left is the recommended food pyramid. On the right is what we advertise to our children. If we look at portion size, it's changed dramatically. And this is insidious. It's sort of like the fat that gets on you that you don't realize you're really carrying around every day. When I was a child, an eight ounce Coke was considered a big Coke because it was bigger than the six ounce Cokes that my parents were used to getting. But an eight ounce Coke has 97 calories. A 20 ounce Coke, which is what you would typically get today, has 242. The bagel is one that I think really resonates with me. 20 years ago, a bagel, a typical bagel, was 3 inches, 140 calories. Today, a bagel is 5 inches and 350. Again, 20 years ago, a hamburger that you'd buy at McDonald's was around 333 calories. Today, the average hamburger is 590. So this creep in portion size is another insidious way that we're, we're increasing calories that we're eating uh, without even realizing that we're doing so. Another thing is food pricing. A lot of our food pricing is set up to encourage these bigger portions. So you can get a 32-ounce Coke, you know, why you need one bigger, um, I don't know, is uh, 99 cents. But for just 20 cents more, you can get a 64-ounce Coke. Which one are you going to buy when you're making that pricing decision? We've changed uh, things that we do with human energy. Uh, we no longer, we, we now have uh, mechanical toothbrushes. We have, and I don't think any of us really wants to go back to dig, digging dishes with shovels, but it's a tremendous change in the way uh, we expend energy. I think this one's more amusing. <laughs> <laughs> but there is good news. There's a panacea. 
Walking is good for obesity, heart disease, depression, uh, your social life, your understanding of your community, and it's something that all of us can do that doesn't really cost a lot. Again, uh, when, when mom used to walk children to school in the morning, she, uh, or dad, uh, you'd get physical activity. You didn't have cars putting pollution into the air. You had time to talk and visit both with the children and with your neighbors and see your neighborhood. Uh, physical activity has been shown to be very good for depression. Uh, you had fewer injuries. Uh, it's good for osteoporosis. And by the way, the infrastructure costs for a sidewalk are a whole lot less for another lane on the street. The research is showing that uh, walkable neighborhoods, I, I really have to laugh when I put up a couple of these slides because by golly, when we have walkable neighborhoods, people are more likely to walk. Um, but the research is showing that this is true and that it does make a difference. Um, in Japan, uh, people who walk 10,000 steps a day lost five to seven percent of their body weight within a year, and it reduced their risk of diabetes by 58 percent. The bad news, we have decided that there is a national Never Walk Anywhere campaign. And there's 12 strategies to this. One, you don't build a sidewalk. Number two, you make, you, you, you build repellent sidewalks. You allow the sidewalks to, that you do build to disintegrate. You build treacherous sidewalks. You put things in the sidewalks. <laughs> you use creative designs. <laughs> Your crosswalks should be dysfunctional. You can combine your strategies. You never place an interesting or useful destination within walking distance of where anyone lives. You just say it. You turn places to park into architectural icons. You make everything car accessible. Pharmacies, dry cleaners, baked goods, your groceries, your liquor. We really have a problem with this one. <laughs> Tobacco, bedding, auto service, fine food, your coffee, your banking. We, we really couldn't figure this one out that says uh, <laughs> Braille for blind drivers. You know. <laughs> Utility bills, drive through sewer payments, drive through wedding chapels. And if the wedding doesn't work out, drive through child support payments. And for the end of life, your drive through funeral. So we're wondering where all this is going to go. Will we uh, do our dentists in a drive through window in the near future? We really could not figure this one out. <laughs> so how do we make healthy choices easy choices? Points about walking. When you're walking, distance matters, destinations matter, and how you design the routes to get there matters. And these are all factors of the public realm, and they're established most basically during the subdivision of land. So like I said, when you're walking, distance really matters. Uh, this is a comparison of a uh, quarter mile uh, distance. Like I said, I come from parks and recreation. I get frustrated because lots of times we'll say, 
uh, we'll say how many, what percent of our population has access to a park, and we'll do this uh, radial buffer around the park and say that percentage of the population can get to the site, when actually, as you can see, if you live at point A and you're trying to get to the park or the school or the store or wherever it is you're trying to go at point X, you may have to travel a great distance to get there, even though, uh, as the crow flies, you may be very, very close. Scale matters in terms of distance. Uh, the, I don't know if you can see it, there's a little blue line that goes across Commonwealth Avenue there in Boston, and then there's the red line that shows that there's seven city blocks uh, and Commonwealth Boulevard in the same distance that we have in uh, one of our arterial roads, the, the little blue line on the bottom on Buford Highway uh, is the same distance as the lovely Commonwealth Avenue and the uh, red line just goes from across the arterial road to the front of the store for the parking lot in one of our strip malls in Atlanta. So it's how you use the space makes a tremendous difference. Destinations matter a lot. And again, this is this connection between destinations and distance. When you have an 800 foot block, and that's not considered to be a large block in many of today's subdivisions, um, if you want to go to a destination that's just on the other side of the block, you're having to walk 1,600 lineal feet. That's, if you're walking at two miles an hour, that's nine minutes and you cross two corners as you make that walk route. If you have 400 foot blocks, you're going approximately 1,200 feet, it'll take you around seven minutes, and you have three corners that you uh, go by. If you have a 200 foot block, you're probably going to walk a little further because you have more streets that you're crossing, but not much, so it'll be seven plus minutes. But at that point, you're going by seven different corners and all the opportunities for different types of destinations and different route choices that you get to make when you do those different corners. Now, I've been taking uh, some history of urban design courses at Georgia Tech, and the professors have said that historically, 200 feet back into uh, Egyptian cities was the standard size of blocks. Uh, a year or two ago, I was in San Diego and I took the little trolley tour of downtown San Diego, and the tour guide uh, was mentioning that um, the, the blocks in the Candlelight District of San Diego are quite small, and he was saying that the developer did that on purpose. He wanted to have as many corners as possible because that's where he got the highest price for, for his lots that he was selling. So design matters. Some streets do not uh, invite walking, others do. So how do we solve the problem? When we regulate, typically today we regulate how we build buildings, we regulate land use, and we re regulate density. But what impacts walking is distance and proximity the destinations that you can get to, and the design of the street and the sidewalk, and its attractiveness as you're trying to get there. So I'd like to really make the point here that it's the framework, it's the street pattern that really determines what happens in a city. Uh, a, the same block can accommodate a park, it can accommodate single family homes, it can uh, accommodate townhomes, it can accommodate apartments, and it can accommodate retail. It's just a matter of density, but it's that framework of the street that doesn't change over time. The subdivision of land into public and private domains, the lots, blocks, and streets is the most basic fundamental design decision that a community makes. The design of that public landscape is what stays for a long, long time, but we put very little effort and have very few tools to deal with that today. Where we put all our effort is in private buildings and private landscapes, which are governed by land use and density. So if we're really going to get at this core issue of walkability, we've got to get to those lever points of how big, how far are people having to walk. Um, historically, uh, we did community design in a very different way. Granite, 
when people came to America, it was public land, and they were coming and building a city whole f from whole cloth. So uh, Savannah, 1733, came up, James Oglethorpe came up with a concept for a city that provides uh, different size lots, different kinds of lots, and public space and utility uh, that was able to be replicated over and over and over again uh, as the city grew. Um, so you had uh, you had lots that were lined up to face major streets. You had um, and they were all I think they were 60 by 120 feet deep. And uh, then you had trustee lots that gave you locations for churches and institutional type buildings. And you had that all integrated in a way that proved to be incredibly flexible over time. So I, I'd like to present uh, Philadelphia. Uh, the first uh, plan here on the left was the plan uh, drawn out in 1794 for the distribution of land, and it was primarily agricultural uses. Over time, uh, it became more and more densely developed. But the streets, the basic street pattern, remained the same. This is uh, 1862 on the left and 1930 on the um, right, 1927, I'm sorry. And then you have the same street pattern is still in place, what, 300 years later today. But it's evolved and changed. The land use has changed. The buildings have changed. The densities have changed. The streets have remained. So this was Savannah. Uh, New York City, 1811. Um, you see the pink line there? That was the developed part of New York City of Manhattan when the commissioners established the commissioning plan of 1811. I'm not sure why I have not studied this, but they platted over 2,000 blocks in New York City with the streets and the grid pattern uh, that is still in place today. The blocks were 200 by 600 feet. When I talk to people that are from New York City, when you're walking the 200 length, people say that you're willing to walk and it feels good and it's a lot of fun. If you're walking the 600 length, that you get really tired and if you go two blocks, you wanna take a cab. But the, the, the message here was that they went ahead and established that street pattern. And uh, there, there are some folks that say that that's probably what has made New York City the city it is today. If it had been developed in little cul-de-sacs that had no connectivity, it probably would never have become the city that it did become. So uh, has anybody not seen this diagram by uh, Duane Zyberg? I was looking at it, I mean, it's usually shown to represent the difference between typical suburban and traditional neighborhood, but I was looking at it in terms of open space. Uh, in my community, we require green space buffers between our developments. Those green space buffers are walls. They limit that connectivity. As long as you're requiring, and that buffer really does not constitute very valuable land. I've had people say, well, it's green space, but it's maybe 40 feet wide, maybe 50 feet wide, and it's usually where you have a fence and the trash collects. A lot of development occurs incrementally. I mean, again, the, the, the lower part of the slide is really nice if you have a big development. If you have a planned unit development, maybe you can make that happen. But most of your development's going to happen incrementally, one small site at a time. And when you're doing that and you require a green space buffer between your, your developments, it doesn't really seem that odd for the first few projects because it's, it's right next to other green space. It really doesn't register at all. But if you went ahead and put a street on that buffer, along that edge, because you do want to have some separation of uses. I mean, I would not want to have a mall right next to my property line in my home, but it might be fine for it to be across the street from me. And if each property, if each one as it develops, you had uh, a street as the buffer, over time you're creating that type of grid and the connectivity in a very incremental kind of way. 
And it also allows you to say, let's, let's put our green space in a consolidated site, something that's really useful and valuable and um, has some um, practical uses for the community. As a parks planner, I can't do a talk like this without talking a lot about parks, so please bear with me. <laughs> so the first question about parks is, is there one? In many places, there aren't. That's the first question. Another one is, how is it located? Um, in the county that I worked in, it uh, had been developed in the early 20s, a lot of it, and at that time, super blocks were very much in vogue. And in, actually, the neighborhood I live in, uh, we have many blocks that have these interior parks. That the, the idea was uh, when you had it inside the block, the children wouldn't have to cross the street to get to it. But what happens is only the children that live on that block have the opportunity to use it. It has very little natural surveillance. There's not this, and particularly when it's being done in a suburban context, it becomes a very isolated place that becomes very difficult to supervise and, and um, to get to. So when you have a park that comes out to the street, uh, then it's being maximized both visibly for the rest of the neighborhood and for that additional access. Another example of what we have a lot of in DeKalb County is where we put the creek in the backyards. Again, the same issue. It's hidden. It doesn't really belong to anybody, even if it is dedicated as a public easement and a public greenway. It's not something you can really get to and use, and you certainly don't have natural surveillance that make you comfortable with having your children go there to play. Uh, here's a, a, a concept schematic of it where if you have your, your creek in the backyard, on uh, the street in the public realm, you have a very limited public realm. Uh, this is a community that actually has a great deal of green space, but you would never know it. I also use this slide uh, to illustrate the basketball goal there. Uh, very, very short driveways. Um, a friend of mine in the development department told me that they probably issue 20 or 30 citations a month in this neighborhood because having the basketball goal out over the street there is illegal. And yet, there's not space to have the, the goal up on your driveway and the streets are too narrow to have on-street parking. Uh, this is the, the corollary to the previous uh, concept diagram where you can see when you put the park in the middle, um, creating buffer, uh, less flooding uh, along the stream. Uh, as part of your public realm, you have that visibility, you have water quality, you have many, many issues that you solve by having the more robust public realm approach. Uh, this is a detention pond in one of our Hope Six projects in Atlanta, where the detention pond has the spray pool to keep the water aerated. You can see there's um, a little bit of green space with sidewalks, and then you have the street and the houses overlooking that space. And, and you feel comfortable with letting your kids go down to, there to play because there are a lot of eyes on what they're doing. Uh, here is a diagram that was given to me by a friend of mine, uh, again, illustrating that when lots are across the street, it gives the entire community access to the park. The connecting streets all are directing their views directly to the park, again, making it a, a, a focal park for this neighborhood and a uh, big amenity. The narrowest lots face this green space. Uh, this, develop, this was a developer who wanted to do more green space in his projects and he couldn't get the financing, the bankers, to, to go along with him. So he went to MIT and had a student there uh, do their dissertation on the value of green space to the development and how to maximize that profit. And so these were some of the techniques that they recommended, that you pay the highest premium for the lots with the greatest access. So you want to put the narrow front of lots uh, across the street so that you get that access and the benefit of that. Uh, this is a little um, triangle in my neighborhood. And again, as a parks person back in the 80s, I kept wondering why was I not concerned about children playing in the middle of the, essentially in the middle of the street. This is a traffic triangle. It's about 150 by 150 feet. And, and I kept looking and I said, you know, I'm really not worried about the kids playing there. And the deal is you're coming you're slowing to a stop sign, and you're, you've got it very visible as you're, you're moving into it. 
a wonderful story here. Our local garden club uh, decided that they wanted to um, plant, do, do planting and annuals and trees in this space. And a little girl that lived across the street, Trina, was about 10 years old at the time, and she heard about it, and she got a petition up and had all the children in the neighborhood sign the petition not to take their play space away, took it down to City Hall, and the City Hall did not approve the planting plan for the garden club. Another example, um, this is from the city of Atlanta, where we were working with a developer who wanted to have a greenway conservation easement along one of the creeks. Um, and he was doing a multifamily development. And we did an analysis and we showed that we did, indeed we needed a community park in this area, a neighborhood park. Uh, the original plan came in so that he had a, a, a central road coming through the middle of the development and that you would access the park by going down between the units and around the dumpster and down to the park. Again, it would not be very um, accessible. So we worked with him, and he was able to get the same number of units, but move the main road over so that it creates that visibility and that access to the park. I think he was very happy, and we felt that it created a much more accessible, um, viable park space. So what do we want to invest in in our neighborhoods? We say that we can't afford parks, that we can't afford sidewalks, but what do we afford? We also... Uh, have many different goals that local governments are required to handle. How can we leverage these goals? Why can't we use our drainage systems as more robust park systems and greenways? Why does it just have to be for stormwater management? Why can't it be leveraged with our parks and recreation? Why do we choose to do things that are just going to cost us money and hazards and lives and um, disasters that we have to come back and deal with as a community when we could be creating amenities that are useful and valuable to everyone. We do make these design decisions. In the 1920s, we fell in love with the automobile. We had a vision of what the world could be like if we designed it to support the automobile. And we have achieved that vision. This is uh, downtown Atlanta. In four square miles, we have 90,000 parking places. Now, when you're building a parking deck, I've been told that um, a parking space costs around $20,000 per parking space. What if we just took 5% of that invested in biking and walking? So again, when we want to get people to walk, we want people to use active transportation, we need to think about the three Ds and their leverage points. Distance, where does that happen? It happens in your subdivision codes. Destinations, where does that happen? It happens with your land use and your zoning. Design, where does that happen? It happens in your development codes. It happens in your design guidelines. Back in the 1850s, we reacted to the health hazards of um, community design, and we developed regulations and methods and techniques to deal with it. We can do it again. Today, physical activity has many impacts on us and our children. It's not just obesity. It's social isolation. It's depression. It's chronic disease. We passed pl planning and zoning laws. I'm sure all of y'all are familiar with the um, Federal Enabling Act, Euclid versus Ambler, the Federal Enabling Act. But are you familiar with the 1937 Federal Housing Administration design recommendations? Very well-meaning people in the 30s uh, came in decided that we were designing cities in a very bad way. And in order to change how uh, developments, the financing, um, well, we also were coming off the uh, depression and the, the loss in real estate values, and we implemented major federal programs. The FHA was underwriting mortgages, and they came out in the 37, 38, with recommendations on how subdivisions should be designed. And if you want it to qualify as a developer, if you want it for houses 
to be eligible for FHA mortgages, you need it to comply with their regulations. In a period of about five years, we changed how subdivisions were developed in this country. Um, so this was from the 1938 FHA flyer. Uh, the top plan is shown as something negative that you do not want to do. The bottom plan is shown as something that, yes, that FHA would like to underwrite for you. So community design and health. Um, what's related to land use? Obesity, physical activity, water quality, access to green space and parks. When we reduce people driving, we address air pollution and asthma, we climate change mitigation, car crashes, pedestrian injuries. injuries. We also have mental health impacts and stress reduction and cap social capital and community cohesion. I just attended a wonderful presentation about the third places and how you enliven and bring community together by creating places for that to happen. It's hard to happen when your community does not have a sidewalk and you have um, automatic um, garages that are facing the street and there's no place for you to meet your neighbor. Uh, I have a friend who developed multi-use trails in Atlanta. He tells a wonderful story about how when he built his first trail, they had kind of done a survey of the neighborhood it was going into before they'd done the trail and asked how people felt about it. And people were kind of ambivalent. It was about 50 people, 50, you know, you had maybe 15% that said, yes, this is the greatest thing that ever happened, and maybe 10% saying, oh, we're not sure what's going to happen with this. And most of the people were pretty ambivalent about it. He said about a year after he built the trail, he got this most wonderful letter from this guy that said, um, you know, I've been living in my house 20 years. He said, two days ago, I was out walking on the trail. I met my neighbor who's lived in his house for 15 years. He was two doors down from me. So I like this slide. <laughs> How did the chicken cross the road? We in public health are wanting to get across the road and deal with some of these issues, environmental issues that affect health. Planning and design is saying, how can we, what are the compelling arguments that we can make for what we're doing? We need to get planning and public health talking together because we are both on the other side of the road. So public health looks at the uh, determinants of health, and we have these nest nested hierarchies that start off with your hereditary factors, then you have your individual lifestyle choices, then you have your social and community influences and your living and working conditions. We really feel like our leverage points to really make a difference in this epidemic of obesity and physical inactivity happen at those social and working conditions and the community <laughs> influence level. And we need to be working together in a much more proactive way to make that happen. So what are some of the tools? Our group has been working with a tool that we call the Health Impact Assessment, or HIA. Um, I am also going to briefly touch on the New York City has developed a series of guidelines that they call their design guidelines. This came out of the uh, health department working with their construction um, and building officials. And we also want to talk about uh, including public health impacts when you're looking at the development of your community plan, your comprehensive planning. Uh, how to talk to your health department and get them involved in that discussion. So what is an HIA? It's this definition. It's a combination of procedures and methods and tools by which a policy program or project may be judged as to its potential effects on the health of a population and the distribution of those effects on the population. I'm really not going to spend a lot of time on it. If you're interested in it, I'd like to um, I'd like to send you to some websites, but what we think can happen here is that it gives a tool to really get planning to proactively talk to the public health people and for the public health people to start talking with planning because they talk different languages. I know as a landscape architect, when I talk about cross sections, I'm thinking about the, the section through a, a street or a building that shows what it looks like. When my public health friends talk about cross sections, they're talking about a population study that's taken as a snapshot in time. And so we, we, we do have these, um, these, these issues in communication that happen from time to time. 
Uh, the process involves uh, doing a screening, uh, just looking, is, it a, is this an appropriate project for HIA? What kinds of things should need to be uh, considered? Then proceeding to do an assessment of those things that are considered, what are the recommendations? And what's really critical that often does not happen in planning and design is we evaluate what were the impacts? What were the effects? I think too often in planning and design, we, we have wonderful intentions like FHA did on their subdivision regulations, but there's not enough thought done into um, what, what actually happened. What is the evidence for it? So again, I've got some handouts if people want them that have the um, websites on them. Uh, New York City design guidelines, they started, uh, uh, the Board of Health started working with their uh, um, American Institute of Architects and their uh, development board uh, talking about what are issues related to health in New York City. They identified problem areas and they provided data. And then they, they convened discussion groups. Well, where are the leverage points? And what can we do about it? who can make these decisions, and what kinds of decisions are implemental for our community. So as an example, uh, they looked at physical activity and they mapped out where are there problems in New York City with physical activity. So they looked at where were the most sedentary neighborhoods. How do we target them? Some interesting things that I'm sharing with you because I just think they're fascinating is that just two minutes of stair climbing a day burns more than enough calories one and a half pounds per year to prevent the average U.S. adult's average annual weight gain. So typically we, we add these pounds, one pound a year, two pounds a year. Just by climbing stairs two minutes a day, we could burn enough energy to preclude that. Men, the, uh, another study showed that uh, men climbing three to five floors today had a 29% lower risk, risk of stroke. I mean, I know we're in Louisiana and we don't have as many tall buildings. I, I come from a little town in coastal Georgia. When I was a kid, the big deal was when we got the post office built and it had a three stories and it had an elevator and one of the treats was my dad would take us down to pick up the mail and let us ride up and down the elevator. So, um, it, but if we build stairs, when, when we're doing our building codes, if we work with our fire department to allow stairs to be something that's accessible and attractive for people to, to use, it can have a big impact on our lives and our health. Um, so what did New York City do? They decided, well, with that information based on that, they said they, they found that interventions, um, I, again, I love this, again, coming from a design background, it seems odd to me that some of these design features are interventions, but that's what they call them in public health. Uh, stairwell prompts, just putting a sign saying, at the elevator saying, there's a stairwell over here, you can use it, makes a big difference. Aesthetic interventions, put, making lighting the stairwell so it's not dark and dingy, putting art in the stairwell putting music in the stairwell makes a difference in people using it. Making the stairs more convenient and visible than the elevator is makes a big difference. Um, one of the things they're experiencing was um, having elevators only stop on every other floor so that you have to take the stairs if you're on one of the in-between floors. Bicycling, just 15 minutes of cycling twice a day will burn the equivalent of 10 pounds per year. Those kinds of things they were building on, they were having discussions and focus groups, what can we do about it? Um, I'm going to move a little faster here. Um, health and comprehensive plans. Again, you can ask the board, your local board of health to highlight what are your local issues? Is it diabetes? Where are there pockets of diabetes? What are the factors that are felt to contribute to that? Evaluate the possible in, um, interventions against your current evidence. Uh, and then brainstorm your implementation strategies. These are things that you can pull the planning department, your design consultants, and your board and health into doing it. Establish your goals and measures. Measures are really important. There's, and parks and recreation, most of my career, we've talked about parks are good, we should build parks. And we've had the funding for parks go down and down and down. Until we come out with really consistent measures that we can say, what is the impact of building a park, we're probably not going to get a lot more 
more funding for them. Evaluate progress. Um, so it starts with you. It starts at home, what kind of food you buy, how active you are. It's in your schools. What kind of food does your school serve? Do they have physical activity programs? Are they built to encourage children to walk to school? As we build big, what I call the factory schools, the bigger and bigger schools that have catchment areas that require people to drive 25 miles because the school is serving 3,000 children, um, that has an impact on your children's health and how the community feels about the school. Those are things that you and your community can address. Uh, community gardens are things that we all love. Um, healthy community design, creating places to walk and to bike. Um, partnerships are critically important. And back to the beginning, obesity and physically, physical inactivity are major U.S. public health concerns, especially for our children. Environmental approaches are more effective than clinical approaches. You can deal with the problem in a proactive, preventive fashion when you're dealing with it in the environment instead of waiting and having to treat the individual one at a time. So go for it, make a difference. And let's have more free range children. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have questions? <laughs> How big were they? The second, I guess, comes out of when you pull the room, there's a lot of planners and designers in the room. You showed the chicken across the road slide. I'm not convinced that there's as big a gap between planners and public health as there is with the conventional wisdom of home builders. It's, it's coming slowly. Let's, like we said, we talk about building capacity. That's what we're trying to do with these health impact assessments. Uh, Robert Wood Johnson spent, I think, $20 million having research so that you would have empirical studies. I know, like with the parks, um, when I went through school, you know, parks were good because physical activity and mental health and social cohesion, and yet then we had the 80s and we had uh, to retrench on public funding and they said, well, that sounds good, but where's the evidence? And we didn't have the evidence. So that's why I had those silly slides that say when you have places for people to walk, people are more likely to walk. They are important. Um, you do have to have that kind of background when you get into those kinds of discussions. So uh, one of the issues, you talk about the parking spaces and the sidewalk. It reminds me, I, I was visiting a friend uh, in his office. He was showing me a plan he had done for a, a public library. And he was saying, uh, D, I just did this public library. It went out to bid. The bid came in a bit high, so we're taking out the sidewalk. I said, why aren't you taking out two of the 25 parking spaces? And he said, well, the 25 parking spaces are required. The sidewalk was optional. Yes.
Well, I do think we have to be careful about that because I certainly don't, it, I think it's like the city beautiful movement, having some beautiful public buildings is not going to cure all the social ills. But the point also is if you don't have the infrastructure to support people that choose to do it, that make it difficult for anyone to do, you're creating a major barrier. And I said, I think, so I think that's the point. It's not that one thing that there's a silver bullet, you know, and that's why I have the health, the, the food. I mean, how much people eat and why they eat what they eat is critically important and certainly a part of it. So it's, it, it is complex. There is not one silver bullet. And it's, it's kind of like tobacco. It wasn't like one cigarette made the cancer rates go up high. It was the culmination of the environment that made it happen. And so we start with the little pieces that we have that we know have effect on it. The question over here. Sure. Yeah, uh, the, the whole issue of school size, park size has the same issue as, as public uh, 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 services are constrained in, in their budgets. They look for cheaper and cheaper ways and the, the, you know, that's why I call them factory schools because the idea is the bigger they are, the more widgets you can put out. You know, that, that is questionable because you have other uh, externalities that happen as a result of that that aren't factored in, but it's, it is a big issue. I've got a couple more questions in the back. You know, I think a lot of this happens at the local level. It's having the local community have a vision of what they want to see happen and then put in place the incentives to make it 
um, desirable to happen. And then it's not just having the incentives in place. I know my local community um, uh, instituted a conservation subdivision, but then they didn't staff it. Uh, ordinance to work with it. If, if you don't have people there to make it happen in a proactive way, you, you lose a lot of opportunities to make things happen incrementally a, as you go along. So, yes, I think federal guidance, uh, you know, this national data set and these things that we're working on at CDC are helpful and valuable, but the reason most of this is locally driven. Uh, land use is locally driven, uh, land development is locally driven, and uh, it, it needs to happen because a community puts in place a vision of what's it, what it wants to be and then continues to work to make it happen. I think we have time for one final question. Okay. <laughs> Let's do two. Okay. <laughs> Make it quick, please. Three more minutes. If I could respond to that really quickly, uh, one of the things, this is not CDC endorsed, uh, but uh, as I've been thinking about this, it seems to me that if communities did take a more proactive point, in, instead of having the, uh, in, in Atlanta we had school parks, then when we, we separated the schools from the local governments and the tax dollars go to the school board and the tax dollars go to the city council. And as a result of that, the school sees these sites as, hey, if we close down one of these small schools that's in a high-priced area, by golly, we can sell it for condos and get lots of revenue, and then the park's gone. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me say, I, I would love to see a, uh, a model where the local government actually owns the land and the school leases it for the school, but it belongs to the community. Could we do one quick one? She, this lady's been trying. Thank you. Oh. I, 
I think we have to wrap up, but I do have some handouts that have some of those resources that I mentioned. Thank you for attending and for contributing.